right. Okay, so today we're going to start chapter seven and we're gonna spend all week on chapter seven. In chapter seven, we're discussing normal probability distribution. You guys, we're going to use this normal probability distribution the rest of the semester. Um, so it's really important we understand how to calculate probabilities and what they mean and, and where everything's located. I want you to recall the empirical rules. I'm gonna draw it out real quick and I'm not gonna be real fancy with it, and I'm, um, but I want you to recall the empirical rule. Oops. <clears throat> So this was chapter three, I believe, the empirical rule. And the empirical rule said that if we had bell-shaped data or symmetric, or what we call normal, it's right here, normal, normally distributed data, um, then we can look at our data and estimate percentages um, and where the data values fall, right? So what the empirical rule does is it, it takes this data set and it breaks it right in half, right? And it says that the mean, now I'm just gonna use the population mean, but can also be X bar for the sample mean, um, is right here in the middle. So the mean is what we call the center, right? So we talk about the center all the time. That's what we mean, it's the middle um, of my distribution. I'm just gonna write mean here in case any of us forgot the notation. Okay, and what the empirical rule does is it breaks it out. Um, so I'm going to just write it out here real quick. I'm not going to be fancy, like I said, but this is 34% of my data. Um, so what this is saying in that is that 68% of the data falls within one standard deviation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add to my mean sigma. So I just want you to recall sigma is the standard deviation and I'm going to subtract sigma from the mean. There we go, I think that focused a little bit better to get this other data value here. Okay, and 68% of my data, approximately 68% falls within these two values. So within one standard deviation of the mean. And we can just continue with this. I'm going to add two standard deviations and subtract two standard deviations. And this will give me, um, sorry, I can't write always and talk at the same time, my 95%. And what it is, it's that middle 95%. And then over here, I can add three standard deviations and subtract three standard deviations. And that gives me 99.7 in the middle, okay? And then of course we have this small area in the tail, it's 0.15%, right? So that's small, 0.15%, okay, in either tail. So that's my empirical rule. I'm just gonna make, um, I'm just actually gonna make a key over here, although I wrote over there. Mu equals the mean, that's my center, and sigma equals the standard deviation, and that's the spread of the distribution. Okay. So we have so many different things that we can talk about with this, but with the empirical rule, we have specific percentages. Oops, I didn't fill this one in. 2.35 and 2.35 here. And when I asked you questions, I would say, according to the empirical rule, right, and it would only be values on this horizontal axis or only values for the percentages that add up or the middle or something, right? And it had to be numbers that were just included in the empirical rule, and that's how it worked. Today, we're going to go take it this a step further. So that's why I want you to uh, just recall the empirical rule, what it looks like and, and how we use this. Um, I want you to keep in mind that 50% of the data is below 
for less than or to the left of the mean, that's the center. And then we have 50% to the right. And, but if we have 50% that's below the mean, this means that we have a 50% chance, here comes my probability, of randomly selecting or randomly choosing a value below the mean, right? And that's what that means. So if 50% of my data is to the left of the mean, that means I have a 50% chance of randomly choosing a number that is less than my mean. So we're going to start tying in probabilities with the meaning here, and we're going to take it a step further. So let's um, just write out a couple ideas here. So we're going to look at area. as a probability. See how my paper is getting whiter, guys? That's because the sun is coming out and it's shining in my room. <laughs> okay, so what we're talking about area as a probability, we're looking at area under the curve. When I say under the curve, I'm talking about under that normal curve, and that represents probabilities. Total area equals total probability. And we should know that total probability equals one or 100%, right? We talked about this last week. <clears throat> We're going to use our technology. To find area or probabilities. What we're going to do is we're going to use the normal density function. We're not going to do this by hand, but we're going to use this normal density function to describe continuous data. So let's make a note here when we're talking about this density function. Density refers to the number of individuals per unit of area. And our function, and like I mentioned, you don't even have to write this down. I'm just going to write it down so we know. Our function is actually y equals 1 over, and I'm going to write this whole function out. Again, we're not doing this by hand, so please do not get intimidated. I'm just showing you what our technology is doing for us. I always run out of room because I'm never allowing myself enough room for all these exponents. Um, but this is what our technology is doing for us, this function. This is our normal density function. I don't want you to get overwhelmed. I don't want you to even think about plugging anything in here. Our technology will always do this for us. It's just, this is the function our technology is using behind the scenes for us when it comes up with numbers, okay? So let me show you some notation that we're using. So we're going to talk about X and we're gonna say X follows this like kind of Wiggle here, but is a follow symbol. And I'm going to use a capital N and I'm going to just fill this in. We'll, we'll talk about what all this means. 
So what this is saying is a random variable x, let me label everything. So this is a random variable. That's x. And this little thing right here is just saying it follows. The capital N is saying a normal probability model. And this is my center and my spread. So right here, we're looking at the center of the curve. And here is the spread of the curve. It's just for right now, the center is the mean and the spread is the standard deviation, right? Sigma. So when we're studying these normal probability models, we always need to know the center and the spread of our curve, just like we did for the empirical rule, right? I needed to know the center and the spread so I can take, I can look at how everything is spread out and how everything should be labeled specifically with my empirical rule, but here the same idea applies. Still need to know the center and spread. So anytime that we have something like this, we're gonna see this um, for a few lessons here, for a few lectures. My random variable follows my normal probability model. All that means is that it's symmetric, it's bell-shaped, right? And I have my center and spread. The reason why I don't always just say center and, or mean and standard deviation, because the center is not always the mean and the standard deviation is not always the spread. So um, these values will change depending on the type of problem we have. Right now for this lesson, it's going to be mean and standard deviation for the center and spread. But we'll see how those will change um, as we move forward here. Let's take a look at an example. We're going to apply the empirical rule and then we're going to start taking it a step further and seeing how we can apply very similar looking um, drawings a little bit further, right? We could take it a little bit further. So I didn't do this for our class and I was kind of contemplating right before class started if I should do this or not. Um, I just didn't want to take up too much time gathering the data, but I was looking at the height of the students. And I, so I have this from last semester. So I took um, a survey and I found the height of my stat one students. Um, and I found that it's normally distributed. All this means is bell-shaped or symmetric. I'm just going to write that. Okay, so we know what that means, normally distributed with a mean of 68 inches and a standard deviation of 2.5 inches. So I have um, this data, like I said, I didn't collect it in our class, but from last semester. So let's take a look at the drawing. I'm going to just start drawing this out. So I'm going to draw my normal curve. That's my bell-shaped or symmetric curve, right? Because I said it's normally distributed. Sorry, that's a little... It's a little off, it's not a great drawing, but it's okay, <laughs> we'll get an idea. Right down the middle should be my mean, okay? And we found that that's 68 here. And I'm just going to mark where my three standard deviations are, um, just so we have some numbers to go along with our curve. So right here, I have 68, and then I have one standard deviation away here and here. So I'm going to add one standard deviation to get my number here and subtract one, just like I would for my empirical rules. So I'm just going to start filling this in. So I have 70.5 here. I'm going to add another standard deviation to get my two standard deviations above. I'm going to add it again to get my three standard deviations above. And then I'm going to do this on the negative side and keep subtracting. So I'm going to have 68 minus the 2.5. And then I'm going to subtract the 2.5 again. I'm going to subtract the 2.5 one more time to get three standard deviations away. 
This is something similar to our empirical rule, right? I'm not going to fill out the entire empirical rule, although I could, but I don't need to do that. We're not really using empirical rule, although we are going to use it for the first part of this example. So here we take this curve. So for part A of this example, I want to find, let's see, what is the probability that a student is between 70.5 inches and 73 inches tall. Okay, so this should look very familiar to an empirical rule problem, something we could have seen like on our exam. And um, I'm just gonna write this out now in some probability notation. We know how, right? So remember when it, when it says, what is the probability I'm going to use capital P? I'm going to try to color coordinate. I know you can't really tell probably a big difference between the black and blue, like I can. So my probability, my capital P of whatever I'm studying. Now I'm not really picky about my notation. It's just as long as you get the point across. So it's the probability that a student's between 70.5 and 73 inches tall. So I'm actually going to write this out as in like math symbol, 70.5 is less than, and you can, in stats, it's not like algebra, so you can use less than or less than or equal to, it doesn't matter. Um, I know in algebra it matters. So you can say X here if you want, you can say student height, you could just say height. I'm just gonna be kind of quick, okay? And then I'm gonna say is less than or equal to my upper bound, which would be 73. So I wanna shade that in in my curve. I wanna see what, where am I looking? So right here, I'm looking between here and here, and I want to know this area under my curve, and I'm going to use that area as a probability. Okay, so I can do this without my calculator right now because I know this because it's using values that are one and two standard deviations above the mean. Meaning I can use my empirical rule actually for this. I could use my calculator if I wanted to, but I could use my empirical rule. So let's just think back here to my empirical rule. If I was looking at my empirical rule, um, one and two standard deviations above my mean, I have 13.5%. And that's exactly where I'm at, one and two uh, standard deviations above. So this is actually going to be 13.5%. So what we do here is we're actually going to box in these values that we have, these data values, and then we circle in the percentages. And if we don't know something, we use like a dotted line. And you're gonna see, I'm gonna use the same notation all the time um, on the team assignments and everything. So it's similar. And this is 13.5% according to my empirical rule. So I'm just gonna make a note here that I use the empirical rule. Just in case anyone needs to go back, then we know we use the empirical rule for that one. We could because the data values are included in the empirical rule, meaning it was one standard deviation above and two standard deviations above. But now this is what I'm saying. I want to take it a step further. I want to use my technology and go a little bit further with this. And I want to actually find probabilities or area under the curve for values that aren't necessarily just one standard deviation above or two standard deviations above or three below, right? I want to go further and be able to do more. And so that's what we're going to do today with that. So this second example says, what is the probability that a student is between 62 inches and 65 inches tall? 
And I want to know, what is that probability? <clears throat> so again, I'm going to write out my probability notation. So I have probability, just like I did up here, 62 is less than or equal to the student's height. You can abbreviate, I'm going to abbreviate different ways just so you can see I, I'm, I'm really not that picky students height and I'm going to say 65. Okay. Um, so now let's take a look. I'm going to go back to my drawing and I want to pick out where 62 is and where 65 is. Well, neither one is part of my empirical rule, right? Like 65.5, but that's not 65. It's 65.5. So 65 is fairly close to here. And then I'm just going to do this. I'm going to write 65 here. And I'm going to box it in. That's my data value. And 62. So 62 is somewhere around here. And again, I'm going to box that value in because it's a data value. And what I'm looking for is this area under the curve between those two values. And I just use like a dotted circle. I always use a circle for my probability. And I use a dotted circle because it's unknown. If I was looking for the data value, I'd use a dotted square. We'll look at an example like that in a minute. So now I need to know, okay, how do I, how do I calculate this? So this is where our technology comes in. Right now, I'm going to show you guys on your calculator. Um, and keep in mind, when we're working on a team assignment, um, we'll have the directions for Minitab. And then if you're using any other technology, you have to kind of um, look it up and figure it out how you're going to get that. Um, so I always just provide directions for Minitab and our calculator. So if you're a calculator user, I'm gonna show you here, hopefully the light is not, nope, we need that. There, maybe that's a little better. Sorry, it's not the brightest. Um, so when we're doing this, I want you to know, um, we're gonna use a couple different functions for this. So here, we're going to use what we call a normal CDF function. So I'm going to write this down as I have this up here. I'm gonna move everything up a little bit so we know what we're doing. So we're going to use a technology to find this. And for this particular problem, I'm going to use the function that's called the normal CDF. So for my normal CDF function, it actually asks for four values in my calculator. So it's going to ask for my lower bound or my lower value. It's going to ask for my upper bound or upper value. It's going to ask for the center of my curve. So for right now, that is mu, and it's going to ask for the spread of my curve. And for right now, that is sigma or S when we're looking at a sample, okay? So um, here we have the center as 68, right? And we know the standard deviation is 2.5. So I already know the values here. So I already know this is 68. And I know this one is 2.5. Now I need to put in my lower and my upper bound. So I need to tell my calculator, where, what am I calculating between? And that's where my drawing comes in, right? Or that's even where my notation comes in. So my lower bound and my upper bound. So my lower bound is 62. It's the value on the left. And then the value to the right is my upper bound, 65. So 62 and then 65. So where do I go in my calculator for this? So if you're using a calculator, so for my calculator, you're going to choose the second button. Kind of. Nope, we can't see it. So I'll write it first and then I will <laughs> go through it. I was gonna do it all at the same time. I'm gonna choose my second button and then I'm going to choose a button that's called VARS, V-A-R-S, okay? 
So when I choose that, what I'm really choosing is distribution. So when you choose the second, you're talking about the blue and right above VARS is called distribution. So that's really what I'm choosing, distribution, but it's second VARS. And from there, I'm going to choose, for me, it's going to be option number two, which is going to be normal CDF. So let me put this over here and we can kind of see this. Okay, so we have our my calculator right here. So it's on, I'm gonna choose second. And then this VARS button right here, which is distribution. And you can see I have a whole list of options. I'm gonna choose option number two, which you can see is normal CDF. That's my normal cumulative distribution function. That's the function we're using. We don't wanna use the PDF. It's not gonna give us the correct answer, not the correct function for this. So I'm gonna choose option two. Now you can see I've already used this function before. I have some values in here. This negative E99, negative one E99. This is saying I'm starting at negative infinity. I'm not starting at negative infinity here. In this case, I'm starting at 62. That's my lower bound. So these are my four values it's asking for, 62. My upper bound, 65. My center, mu, see it's at zero. It will default to zero and one. It's not zero and one, it's 68 and 2.5. So I just need to make sure I change everything, go down to paste and then hit enter. So this just brought everything in. I have to hit enter one more time and there it is. So we can see here when I plug into my calculator that area here in this curve, under the curve right here is 10.69%. So right here I could say 10.69% or you can write it as a decimal. And for this problem, we can say, okay, this is 0 0.1069, right? And we can actually talk about the probability as a decimal or a percentage. If you are talking to someone that's not in stats class, a percentage makes sense to them, not the decimal. So that's how we use our calculators to find this. So we use this normal CDF here, this normal CDF when we are looking for a probability. So we use normal CDF when finding a probability. Okay. Okay, so let's find another one. Let's try this again with another problem. So here, part C, what is the probability that a student is above 67 inches tall? So the key word is here is what, or key phrase, what is the probability? That tells me I'm finding a probability. And that's what I just wrote here, that if, we, if we're finding a probability, we're using that normal CDF function, okay? So if I'm finding this probability, I'm going to write it out in probability notation. So let's see here. I'm going to look at, find the probability. Now it says that a student is above 67 inches tall. So think about what that means. It means 67 inches and more, right? Greater than. So you can write this a couple different ways. I always tend to write it in the same format like I did the first two problems where I have 67 is less than or equal to I'm just, I'm going to write it as X this time. I told you I'm gonna write it in all different notations so you can see it doesn't matter. Um, so my random variable X, and then I'm going to do less than or equal to, now I need to put some upper bound here. So it's above 67 inches. And here I'm actually going to include infinity. So what happens here is my 
my calculator does not understand context. You and I know that someone can't be an infinite number of inches tall, right? My calculator does not understand that. My, the density function does not know context. It doesn't know what we're talking about. All it knows is I'm, I'm going to calculate 67 and above. So let's take a look at the drawing. So I'm going to find 67 here. So 67 somewhere is around here, I would say. So I have 67, I box that in, and I'm looking at everything to the right of 67. So I'm going to shade that in, and I'm looking for that probability. I'm looking for that area under the curve. So again, I'm going to use my calculator. I'm going to use the same function as I've used before. So second VARS, option two. You'll see everything's in there from the last problem. I need to type over everything and put it in from the new problem. My lower bound, and you can see right from the picture, is my value on the left, that's the 67. Now my upper bound, my upper bound is all the way up here. I don't wanna just stop at like 80 or 100, right? Cause like I'm saying, the calculator does not understand um, context. It just knows the numbers I'm putting in. I have to use this infinity. So here, I'm just gonna write this out real quick so you can see what I'm gonna type in here. So I'm going to type in normal CDF, my lower bound, my upper bound is infinity, and then the center is 68, and the spread of the curve is 2.5. That's what I'm going to type in. So to type in infinity, my calculator is not that smart. I don't have an infinity. So here I just have to use a really, really large number. You can use like 10,000. You can use 10 to the power of 10. I'm just going to use 10,000. Okay. 10 to the power of 10 is if maybe if your whole context is in thousands or something, right? you'd want to take it like that step further. So you could do 10 to the power of 10 if you want. It's just a really large number. So here, when we're talking about numbers that are 68 and numbers that are all under 100, 10,000 is a really large number. Okay? If you don't want to have to think about that, just use 10 to the power of 10 all the time. Our center is still 68. Our spread is still 2.5. So now I can go ahead and paste that. Remember, I have to hit enter twice. And right here, I'm going to get an answer of 0.65 Five, four. So here I get 0.6554, which means I have a 65.54% chance of choosing a student that is 67 inches or taller, right, from my last semester, step one. What that means is, is that, you know, that's the probability, but when you look at this curve, that should make sense. Right? Look at where my, my 67 is. It's to the left of my mean, right? Didn't I say before that everything to the right of the mean is 50% and the area to the left of the mean is 50%? So if I'm starting to the left of the mean, but I'm calculating the area to the right, I'm, I've shaded in more than half my curve, my area should be more than half. So it should be above 50%, and it is. So that's what the curve does for us. It gives us that visual. It's so nice to see what's going on and what we're calculating. So I want you guys to get in practice of drawing a curve. It does not have to be this detailed, okay? It could be something really simple. So that's using my normal CDF. So you can calculate between two values. You can calculate above a value. You could also do below a value. If you're going to do below a value, I would just use like negative 10,000, okay? A large negative number. So um, if you were doing below the 67, okay? I would just use negative infinity, not zero. I know, and you know someone can't be below zero inches tall, but again, the function does not understand context. It does not know, okay? Let's take a look at a different type of problem. So what if we have this curve and we have the probability? So I'm going to say, well, 40% of the students are below a certain data value, but I don't know what that data value is. So I want to know what is this data value? 
So if I'm looking at my curve, I can actually visualize it and then I can use my technology to take it a step further. So here, instead of, um, I'm not gonna write any probability um, notation out because I'm not calculating probability. If you look, I'm given the probability and that's 40%. So if I am given the probability, then that means I'm going to work backwards. Think about algebra class. Normally you're plugging a value of X in to get a value of Y out, right? If you use an inverse function, that means you're plugging a value of Y in to get a value of X out. That's an algebra. We can do the same thing here and we can use our inverse function. So for this type of problem, when we're given a probability, let me write this, it's given, and we want to find a data value. What we're going to use is called the inverse norm function in our calculator. Our inverse norm only asks for three pieces of information. The inverse norm is going to ask you for the area or the probability okay, that you're given. We wanna make sure this is in decimal form, right? This is a math, so we want it in decimal form, not percentage. And I want you to also know that it always needs area to the left. So when we're looking here, you may be given the area to the right is 60%, but then that would mean the area to the left would be 40%, right? So all adds up to 100%. So we always need to include area to the left. And again, we're going to include the center and the spread of the curve. And for now, for us today, the center is the mean and the spread is the standard deviation. So for this problem, I'm going to write 0 0.40 in here, or you could just use 0 0.4. You don't really need the zero. And then the center is the 68 and the spread is 2.5. So I'm gonna go back to my calculators. I'm going to look in a very similar area. And I'm gonna write this down for you guys first. And this one, I'm still gonna to go to that second bar. So I'm still looking at the distribution and I'm going to choose option number three, which says inverse norm. So let me show you this. So for my calculator, second, I'm going to choose bars, distribution. Look at my option number three right here. It says inverse norm. That's the one we're going to use today. I'm going to choose that. And there's the three values it wants, area, mean, and standard deviation. So my area is always the area to the left. I'm being told that the area to the left is 40. The reason why I'm being told it's 40 is because it says below. 40% are below, okay? So what I'm looking at, and I can show you on the drawing, the drawing gets messy by the end of the class. So what I'm looking at is that I have some value and it's 40 or below. So I'm looking down here, right? So if this was, at 63%, I'm right around here. I'm like right by that, okay? I'm right by the 67 value. I'm, I'm gonna guess it's gonna be really close to that 67. I'm looking at the 40% to the left here. Okay. So I'm gonna plug this in. I'm going to plug in 0.40. It's like such a habit to put the zero in there. It's unnecessary. 68 for the center and 2.5 for the spread. Arrow down to paste press enter. Again, I need to press enter one more time. And here I get 67.37. So what this is saying, if I want to be specific, it's 
67.37 inches. So 40% of the students are below 67.37 inches. And that's what I thought. I thought it would be really close to 67 because we already did this when it was 65%, right? So I know it's gonna be over here. Okay. And that's using the inverse norm. The inverse norm is just doing the opposite. It's taking, sorry, that looks like a mess there. There we go. So the inverse norm is when you're given a probability and you are finding a data value. So let me just write that. Use inverse norm when given a probability and finding a data value. That's when we're gonna use inverse norm. Now you guys, we can do this on, um, you can do this in all different technology forms and you can do this on Minitab as well. And it's everything's gonna be the same idea. I want you guys to keep in mind and think about this. This is so important to us. It's always area to the left that you're plugging in. Some of you have a smarter calculator than others and it would be smarter than mine because mine's not that smart where you could actually say, well, I'm, no, I'm going to enter area to the right or I'm going to enter area in between. But for most of our calculators, it just has area to the left. It doesn't even say it. You just have to know that's what it is. Guys, do you have any questions?